Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Your last words are very, very important. Uh, I've spent 50 years or more listening to the last words of people uh, just prior to them going home to be with Jesus. While on the cross, uh, Jesus made seven statements. Uh, and we are looking at those seven statements in these uh, next few weeks. You remember last week, um, we had a, a word of um, uh, pardon there on the cross or a word of promise on the cross. And uh, I was reminded of my uh, Uncle Dave, one of the most uh, wicked men that I think God's ever allowed to live on this earth. And uh, I remember visiting him at the Transylvania County Hospital, and he was just crying so loud that you could hear him all over the hospital about why God would not want him. Uh, that God would not want him because he was illiterate. He could not read. And uh, I really could not get beyond that. I knew he only had just a short time to live. And uh, we ministered to him for quite a while. And uh, the last thing my Uncle Dave did here on this earth was finally came to grips with the fact that God loved him just like he was. And though he had never ever as far as I could see and tell and nobody else could either ever um, did anything for God here on this earth he received Jesus into his heart and life just in his final breaths in the last second uh, of his life and um, I I'm grateful though that there's a record of one that's really more famous than my uncle Dave ever thought about being and that is this thief on the cross who in his dying moments uh, asked the Lord Jesus to save his soul. Um, you've heard me say down through many years, um, how do you know that you are saved? Can you go back to that moment in time uh, when you turned away from sin and placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, what, what is the assurance that you have? that your sins are forgiven and that you will spend eternity with Jesus in heaven. I've asked you that a number of years and today I'm going to answer that. I'm going to be probably as clear and as concise to the point as I've ever been. And the reason is I want you to understand as your pastor, first of all, I love you. I care about you. Uh, I want to spend the rest of my days uh, teaching you the Word of God and seeing as many come to faith in Christ as I can. And uh, I want to spend the rest of my days helping people have the assurance that when they die, that they are going to heaven and that their sins are forgiven, that they understand why they can have the assurance, how they can have the assurance, and be confident in that fact. I want you to have that today. And by the way, I believe with all of my heart, when you leave here today, there, there's not going to be any reason whatsoever for anyone to be confused as to whether or not that they have a personal, intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. There, there's no reason for anyone to leave here today wondering what it takes for a person to be saved. Won't be any reason today for anybody to walk out of the building, get in their car and go home and doubt whether or not they have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you, all of you that are here, all of you that are watching by live stream and television, I want you to settle this matter of your personal salvation today. All right? Two thieves. One on each side of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of them blasphemed. One of them demeaned. One of them ridiculed the Lord Jesus Christ. And the second one who had 
an entire life of crime. We don't know all of the sins that he committed. We just know that he was dying for some of those sins. Uh, an entire life of crime didn't know a whole lot, but he knew enough to be saved. Pick it up with me, if you will, in Luke 23 and verse 39. And one of the male factors which were hanged railed on him, blasphemed him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, seeing that we're in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now let me give you a few things that this old boy knew as he turned to Jesus and he said to Jesus, remember me. You haven't done anything whatsoever to warrant this action on you. I'm getting what I deserve. And Lord, I want you to remember me. When you come into your kingdom, Jesus says to him, today, you'll be with me in paradise. Let's look for a minute at some of the things that this old boy knew. First of all, he knew his destiny. Look with me again at verse 40. He says to the other guy that's hanging on the other side, he said, don't you fear God? Uh, seeing we, we're in the same condemnation, we're getting what we deserve in verse 41. But this man has done nothing. He, he, he just looks at this old boy and he says, Hey, dude, don't you know that in the next three or four minutes that we're going to be dead? Don't you know that in the next few minutes that we're going to be standing before a holy God? And tell me, with that in mind, how in the world could you possibly be saying this and condemning and judging and ridiculing and blaspheming. Hey, we know where we're going. So he knew that in the next few minutes he had a destiny that he was going to be standing before God and giving an account for his actions. And he said, don't you realize that? And, and you know that to be true. So how could you possibly be saying these kinds of things to Jesus? So he knew his destiny. I'm convinced that a lot of people disregard God, ignore God, living their own plans for their own life apart from what God has in store for their life, living for and banking up stuff, living to the satisfaction of the flesh and living in sin is because deep down in their heart, in their mind, they think that after this life is over, there's nothing else to it. A lot of people live their life like that. Can I just say to those that may have that tendency, that is a fatal mistake. That is a fatal flaw. Death is not the end. It is just the beginning. And if you're fortunate to live about 80 years or maybe even 100 years, uh, that, that's all well and good. But may I say to you, you're going to live somewhere forever in eternity. God made you to last. God made you for forever. And you're either going to spend forever with God or you're going to spend forever separated from God, depending really on the decision that you make down here in this life. Uh, and it's wrong to think that this is it, that there's nothing more after this. And may I say to you this morning, all of you, eternity is a long time to be wrong. You're going to face God. And one of these days you're going to give an account to God 
for the life that you have lived here. And you can ignore God down here, but you're not going to ignore God up there. You can run from God down here, but you're not going to run from God up there. Hebrews chapter 9 says that it is appointed unto man once to die. And after that, there will be an accounting time for everybody. By the way, that's an appointment that you won't be able to cancel. It's an appointment that you won't be late for. And the last time I looked in North Carolina, the stats really have not changed. One out of every one die. <laughs> and it's absolutely stupid. It's asinine. It's illogical. It is irrational. It is foolish. Knowing that you are going to die to put, and by the way, not knowing when that time is going to come, to put off trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. There's only one thing that's sure in this life. And somebody said, was it uh, Abraham Lincoln or Thomas Edison or somebody? I can't remember who said it, but uh, there, there, there was only one thing sure in life, and that, or two things sure in life, and that's death and taxes. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, there's only one thing sure in life, and that's death. And we're going to experience it. Number two, he not only knew his destiny, he knew his depravity. In verse 41, he says, we're getting what we deserve. We're getting what we deserve. We receive the due reward of our deeds. In other words, uh, I know that I'm a sinner. Uh, I know that I've done wrong. I know that I'm getting what I deserved. And you know what, what, what this is called right here is confession. He is confessing the fact that um, I, I am a sinner, uh, that I know that I have sinned. So he wasn't hiding from the fact that he had done things that he shouldn't have done. He was not excusing away the fact that he had done some things that he should not have done. He's confessing it. I, I, I'm, I'm getting what I deserve. I'm grateful for 1 John 1 and 9. It's probably one of the most quoted verses of Scripture uh, that I have in my arsenal uh, of memory today. If we confess our sins, God is faithful. I don't know about you, but I, I sure do like that part. God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. He knew his destiny. He knew his depravity. He knew that he was a sinner. I, I don't know everything that this man had done, but I just know this that he knew that if he would do his part, God would do his part. And I'm here to tell you today, if you'll do your part, God will do his part. I don't know everything that he did, but I know what James 2 says, that if you break one of the laws, you've broken all of them. If you broke one law, you're a lawbreaker. If you lie, then you're a liar. If you sin, then you're a sinner. And some people think that if I'm just better than other people, that I'm going to get into heaven. That is not so. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Imperfect people cannot get into a perfect heaven. That would be like having a bunch of imperfect people in a perfect place. It would be like earth. It would be hell on earth or like that. So God then has to come along and he has got to make us perfect to get into that perfect place. And may I say to all of us here today, God does not grade on a curve. Let's just pretend for a minute 
that God did have some kind of scale, zero being extreme evil and a hundred being perfection and perfection is what it's going to take to get into heaven. Let's take some personalities down through history for a minute and, and let's just analyze where they may fit onto that scale. Let's think about Hitler for just a minute. I, I think that Hitler would be in the minus category on the other side of that, the extreme evil part about it. Let, let's think about Mother Teresa, my word. Uh, what a historical giant she has been in, in serving God here on this earth. But even Mother Teresa would not be able to achieve. She still had lust. She still had anger. She still had issues in her life. She may be about an 80, but she certainly wasn't 100. Let's think about Mike Whitson for a minute. He's about 15. Let's think about you for a minute. We'd be, you'd be about a 45 on that scale. But fact of the matter is God does not grade on a curve and perfection has only been achieved by one and that is the God of this creation who was perfect. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He knew his destiny. He knew his depravity and he knew his deity he knew jesus was deity we deserve what we're getting he says but this man has done nothing and if you study out the greek tense of that statement it literally says never 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 has done anything wrong he knew that he was more than just a mere man. Uh, this one, uh, I wonder, could, anybody that you could say that about? They never, 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 never did anything wrong. But he was saying that about Jesus. Um, you, you understand that only perfect being, as I said a moment ago, that has ever existed is the God of this universe and that's why it is that only Jesus can save you because you need a perfect Savior because you're trying to get into a perfect place and imperfect people are never going to get there without a perfect Savior. I, I did something uh, this week. that You ought to go home and do this. It's real interesting. Um, I don't know how many of you do computer stuff or not, but go home and Google... Who saved more lives than any other human being? Question mark. Just put it in Google. Now wait till you get home. I know you got your tablets and you're just about to do it. You can't wait till you get home and you're going to do it right now. It, it, here's what's going to happen. Th there's a name coming up by the name of Norman Borlock. Um, B-O-R-L-A-U-G. I found out that Norman Bolt, I never heard of the guy, never heard of him before in my life. Uh, but he died at 95 years old in 2009. And back in the 20th century, uh, Norman Borlock was an agricultural scientist. And he designed and developed um, in agriculture a high yield, drought resistant, disease resistant crop that is said to have saved over a billion people in areas like the Middle East that have severe droughts all of the time, over a billion people. Uh, he's the only man, one of six men uh, to have received the Nobel Peace Prize, the Congressional Medal of Honor, and the Presidential Medal of Free, uh, Freedom. He, he's one of only th six people that ever received all three of them. And, and if you were to ask Norman Borlaug, are you the greatest savior of the world? He would have said, absolutely not. Because Norman Borlock was a child of the king. He was a Christian. He was born again. 
And one day when he was receiving one of those awards, I don't remember which one, he quoted the book of Isaiah. And he was always telling people as they would leave uh, his presence, God be with you. God be with you. He knew that Jesus Christ. Norman Borlock, having saved over a billion people, still wouldn't get up to the hundred on the scale of perfection. Only Jesus. And he's the only hope that you and I would ever have. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. What an exchange that that is. God says, I'm going to take all of Mike Whitson's sin and I'm going to put all of his sin on my son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ went to the cross and paid my sin debt. He paid all of it. Then God says, I am going to take the perfection of my son and I'm going to put it on Mike Whitson and cover Mike so that he can be perfect, so that he could get into my heaven. What a deal that that is. My word, who wouldn't want that deal? God takes our sin and gives us Jesus. What an exchange. By the way, um, I want you to have that exchange. I want you to know what that's like. Let me give you number four. He knew only God's grace could deliver him. He knew only God's grace could deliver him. He just said to his buddy on the other side over there, he says, we deserve to die. You, you know that. But then he turns right around and says to Jesus, will you remember me when you get into your kingdom? Here's a guy who was totally out of hope. He had nowhere else to turn. He had exhausted all human effort. Nothing else to do. He had lived and wasted life of entirety in there. And, and, and now everybody had forsaken him and rejected by everybody. And this whole deal now was out of his control. And he was not comparing himself with anybody else, including the other thief. He was not excusing the way that he had lived and why he was hanging there on the cross. He was out of control and not blaming anybody or bargaining with God whatsoever. He just turned to Jesus and he said, will you remember me? And he throws himself on the grace and the mercy of God. I love what he said. I love what he said. Some of the simplest words of salvation that could ever be uttered. Remember me. Wasn't some long, flowery, mechanical, put together, all under control kind of prayer and saying just the exact words that have to be said for salvation? No. Just a simple, Lord, remember me. Can, can I... Can I say to any and all of you that are here this morning that may be struggling with this thing called salvation and a relationship with Jesus and you're thinking, well, I don't know how to pray and I don't know what to say. Can I just say to you, it's not the position of a bunch of words in a sentence or a paragraph. It is the direction of your heart. Um, I served on the JARS board for a number of years just really intrigued a whole lot by Wycliffe Bible translators and have been for a number of years. And I can't remember the country, nor can I remember the missionary's name right now, but there was a Wycliffe missionary that went to a very remote area in South America and uh, was going to translate one of the gospels. I think it was Mark, I'm not sure. It's going to translate one of the gospels into their native tongue and he spent eight years in that little village 
talking about Jesus, witnessing about Jesus, living for Jesus in their midst. And for eight years, not one person came to faith in Jesus. He finishes the gospel and he's getting ready to go on furlough. And one of the uh, villagers had a horrible heart attack and was carried to the hospital. He was unresponsive and in a coma. Outlook was pretty bleak. And so before this missionary left out of the country to go back to the States, he goes by the hospital and the young man's name was Juan. Juan came up out of that coma and the missionary says, Juan, do you know that Jesus loves you? And Juan says, see, do you know that if you will ask him to forgive you, that he will forgive you of your sin and save your soul. Juan says, see. Missionary says, will you do that right now? Juan says, see. And with that, he went back into the coma. Five years later, this missionary comes back into town. You know what he went back into that village and you know what he found? He found a village with a thriving church of about 50 to 65 villagers. And, and, and the missionary got to inquiring. He says, wow, was there another missionary that came after me? Did he tell you about Jesus? Did he, did he share the gospel? And they said, no, no, no. You remember Juan? Juan got better. Juan came back to the village and he told us about Jesus. Juan had a one word prayer. See. See. It's not about a bunch of words that you put together and you think that they have to be just perfect. It's the disposition of your heart. I'm calling out to God, just remember me. Taking everything and a everything that you know and understand about who you are and just casting that on everything that you know and understand about Jesus. Man, I want to tell you, when I got saved, I, I didn't know about the virgin birth. I didn't, wasn't able to explain any of that stuff. I didn't know what atonement meant. I, I didn't know what propitiation meant. I didn't know what sanctification meant. All I knew that day was that God said, I love you just like you are. And I cast everything that I knew about me onto everything that I knew about that. And God changed radically this old mountain boy. And he'll do the same for you. The Bible says in Acts 16, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Jesus from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Jesus turns to the guy and he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. May I say to those of us that are here today, our assurance of going to heaven when we die, our assurance that our sins have been forgiven is not on how good or bad that we are or not something that we have said in our voices. It is simply the promise of God. Let, let me give you a second is the promise of salvation. Um, I'll, I'll have to go quickly here if I can. I want you to look at what Jesus said. He said to this young man, he says today. So salvation is very sudden. Today, he didn't say, today you're going to have to go into purgatory and spend some time in purgatory and paying for some of your sins and have somebody pay you out. And by the way, purgatory is not a biblical concept or teaching that is here. He didn't say that at all. He said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I promise you, when you get into heaven and you've been there about a second 
and you see everything that God has in store for you, you're going to come to grips. You're going to think, wow, what was I thinking? Why in the world did I waste all of my life on that stuff down there on earth that had nothing to do with what I'm doing now? Not only was it sudden, it was sure. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. <laughs> His old boy didn't have to say, well, I hope I'm going. And you know, that's a, that's a common response when I ask people, do uh, you have the assurance you're going to go to heaven? Well, I hope so. Well, I think I am. Well, I'm going to tell you, friend, when God says he'll forgive you of your sin and I'll carry you to heaven one of these days, you can count on it. It's not a hope so or a think so. It's a no so. It's sure. And it's sweet. I like this next part today. Thou shalt be with me. Well, it took me a long time to get here. It took me 21 years to get here. But I want to tell you something, friend. Salvation is not about a religion Salvation is about a relationship. So many friends make fun of me. So many of my preacher friends um, kind of chide me and make fun of me and goad me on this kind of stuff. But I'm going to tell you, I have a relationship with Jesus. I talk to him. He, he talks to me. And, and here's what I know. The more that I have grown to know him, the more he talks to me. My sheep hear my voice and they know me. They follow me. I've been listening to him speak to me for 51 years. It's a relationship. And, and then fourth, it is satisfying. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Can I say to you, heaven is a real place. It's not a figment of somebody's imagination. It is a prepared place that God has in store for those who will place their faith and their trust in him. Let me give you finally the place of salvation. You, you're asking questions like, well, when can I be saved or where can I be saved? Second Corinthians chapter six, verse two, the Bible says, now is the best time. Today is the day of salvation. Here were two men hanging beside Jesus. Two men who made two different choices. One to chose to blaspheme, the other chose to trust. Okay, let me say that that same choice is among us even today. We have a choice to make. You say, well, you know, I, I appreciate and I believe everything that you are saying today. And, I, you know, you're right, Pastor, but, you know, uh, I'm just not ready to make a decision today. Well, not to decide is to decide. It's a decision that says, I don't care, God, what you think about me. I don't care that you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross for me. I don't care that you have a divine plan all mapped out for my life. I'm going to live my life the way that I choose to live my life. Or then you have the choice that the word of God says whosoever and you could put your name right there shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's God's promise to you. Somebody says there's nothing that God can't do. Yeah, there is. God cannot lie. And God cannot step outside of his own character. And God says that if you'll just trust and believe and call on me, I will save you. And I'm asking you today as your pastor, would you just settle it? I believe with all of my heart. I believe this till the day that I die. God prepared you for this moment in your life. God prepared this moment for you to settle this matter of where you're going to spend eternity. Long before any of us were ever born, 
God looked down through the eons of time and he set aside this moment to forgive your sin. He set aside this moment to receive you unto himself. He set aside this moment to write your name in the Lamb's book of life. He set aside this moment to change you forever and ever. Now I'm asking you to make that decision today. Would you stand with me? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed, please. And no one leaving, if we could, just remaining here for just a moment, please. I don't want to disturb the moment when somebody is really deciding of where they're going to spend eternity. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. You know, I said a few minutes ago, it's not about a set of words. It's not about a particular prayer that you have to pray. And that's true. I'm just going to lead you in a, in a prayer in a minute. And here's what you can do. You can say, you know, Lord, I agree with that. Yes, Lord, that's what I want. Let that be my prayer, God. Just any of that. Just agree, if you will, with what I'm about to say, okay? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Father, just repeat this, if you will, or agree with me or say yes to it, whatever. Father, I know that one of these days I'm going to die. And I know that I'm going to spend eternity in one of two places. Either heaven or hell. And I know that Jesus is the only way that I could ever be with you. So I agree with you, Father, that I have sinned and come short of your glory. Please forgive me of all my sin. I receive you into my heart right now. I willingly turn away from sin and with your help I'll live for you the rest of my life. Thank you for forgiving my sin. Thank you that you keep your promise. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.